Thanks. Yeah. Yay. Perfect. Got everything. Okay, great. Hello, everyone, and welcome to another symposium. Today, we're going to talk about a few topics. Uh, free structures was one of the, the, the highlighted topics, uh, but also isomorphisms and cardinality and church encodings and all sorts of weird, crazy terms. Um, but the, the overlying idea that uh, I want to just uh, gape in awe at is this uh, duality between data and, and functions, data and interpretation, and how they're related, and how that can be a practical benefit to us, but also how it can just sort of uh, be this interesting view uh, of, of programming in general. And it might, might be able to subsume different understandings or worldviews into this one cohesive way of viewing all of code. Sort of. I'm still I'm still working on it. Uh, I'm not sure if it's going to be like airtight, but I at least hope to give you a few related ideas. Put a few related ideas on the table, and we can all just sort of behold how uh, interesting and seemingly related uh, they are, uh, and and maybe get some practical benefits out of it as well. But before we get into that, a couple of uh, housekeeping notes, which is that uh, we have this Zyverge Tech Symposium. Uh, repo where we are going to be putting this code and we've put other previous code uh, in and, and just push it up. Uh, but we decided, uh, I think last week, maybe we mentioned that we're going to use this repo. Also, if anyone has any particular questions or requests for topics, feel free to just make a new issue here. And there's a couple labels, topic request, question, or just do whatever you want, really. If there's something you want us to address in a symposium, something you want us to talk about, or if you want us to maybe help you with solving a particular problem in a way that could be educational for lots of people, uh, just open an issue and uh, then we won't lose track of it. And we will, yeah, GitHub is a great to-do list for us. So I will post a link to that in the Discord. Oh, no, that's the wrong channel. <laughs> Here's <gasps> the right. <laughs> I wish I could channel Bartosz Maluski. He's a, he's a hero. Um, Cool. Yeah, he's got a cooler accent. Uh, so yeah, let's just get started. There's, there's so much to do. Uh, so let's let's dive right in. First of all, I want to talk about just what is a type. Let's just get some definitions out of the beginning uh, and that we're going to use as we go along. And if there are any questions, as usual, drop them in the Discord and we will take a look and try to answer them. Uh, I'm going to go as fast as I can whilst hopefully not losing clarity or information. So. If anything is confusing at any point, let me know and we can go over some more examples and, and try to make everything crystal clear. We need good foundations. Okay, so what is a type? Well, a type is really just a set of, of possible values. So that's kind of the, one of the definitions of, of a type. It's just this label on a box and that box has in it every possible value of that type. So for instance, Boolean is just a set of the values true and false. There is no Boolean itself. Boolean is just this label on the box of all Booleans in which is true and false. So it's, a, it's sort of a, a set of possible values. And then cardinality is this fancy word for basically just the size of a set. Uh, and if since a type is a set, or we could view a type as a set, then the, the cardinality of a type is basically how many values it has. So Boolean with this little number up here has a cardinality of two. Uh, int uh, happens to be a 32-bit integer, which means that there are two to the power of 32 values of int. And that is, oh, it's, it's, it's finite. So we could, if we wanted to enumerate them and it's gonna go all the way from negative two to the 31st power uh, and <laughs> to negative two to the 31st power plus one all the way to zero and then all the way up to two to the 31st power minus one because it's a signed integer. So we, we lose one bit for the sign. But nonetheless, if we counted up all of these numbers uh, it would be two to the 32 distinct values. So way bigger than Boolean, but still it has a finite cardinality uh, that we can count. Uh, string uh, happens to be an, an infinite uh, size because every time you have a string, you could just keep adding another exclamation point if we wanted to uh, up on to infinity. Okay, but why is cardinality uh, useful or interesting uh, despite just being a, a fancy, fancy word we can throw around instead of saying size of a set or something? Uh, well, if you have two types, let's say we had another type called toggle here. Uh, in Scala, this would be a sealed trait that maybe had the case on or off. We can observe that both of these types have the same cardinality. And when two different types have the same exact cardinality, 
and there's, they're sort of in a special relationship with one another. You're able to write these two functions, one that goes from Boolean to toggle. You could sort of map each Boolean value to a corresponding uh, value in toggle. So we can map true to on and false to off. This is a strange uh, implementation of it, but it's still, it's, it's just to make it extra clear what's happening. Obviously, you could just do if Boolean else, but just to make sure we're mapping true to on and false to off. And then, yeah, so now we see that the regular, we can go the other way and check to see uh, each of these cases. And we can go back from toggle to Boolean in this one-to-one -one mapping. And Given this one-to-one -one mapping, we can do something interesting. We, could, we can make these round trips. So if we start at a toggle, we can call toggle to Boolean, which will send it to true. And then we can, on the result of this, call Boolean to toggle and send it back to the value that it started at. And we can do this uh, uh, basically um, with starting from either position. And basically, on is the same thing as round tripping on through these two functions that just cycle them back and forth. So we make this little loop per value. And we can do the same thing with, with off. We basically have this one-to-one -one correspondence between two sets. And we're able to do that because they're of the same size. So you can kind of just put this, this two sets together and just zip down them and say, this value is going to be associated with this value. Um, and all that really matters is that we're consistent. If we wanted to, we could have mapped on to off, sorry, on to false and off to true. That's just as legitimate, but maybe this feels a little more uh, correct. Okay, uh, so whenever you have two types that uh, for which you can define these two functions and you can basically round trip starting at either place when you have this one-to-one -one correspondence, these are called uh, isomorphic types. There's an isomorphism between these two types. And uh, that means that they have the same shape. That's kind of just the, the roots of those words. Uh, so they're not identical. Uh, uh, the, the Scala com compiler will not allow you to pass in a toggle type where you've annotated that it accepts a Boolean, but uh, they are almost as good as the same. They contain the same amounts of information in some way. And you can always just translate first that toggle into a Boolean and then call that same function. Or if you receive a Boolean from a function, but you want a toggle, you can always just translate it. So it's as good as the same uh, for all intents and purposes, even though they might have different performance characteristics, but at a type, type theoretic level, they are basically identical. So. To recap, types are sets of values, cardinalities are sizes of sets, and two types of the same size are essentially interchangeable. Uh, and, and that interchangeable uh, can be expressed with this fancier word, if you feel like being fancy, uh, and say that they're isomorphic. And just as a quick example, we can have the alphabet. If the alphabet were a type, it would have a, a cardinality of 26. And we could also have some parallel universe with a different alphabet, uh, which had different symbols. Um, but if everything in these two different universes were identical except for the alphabet we chose, we could still read their books. We would just have to sort of uh, get the isomorphism between these, right? And then we can translate any sentence. It's, it's the same ideas would be encoded that we would just have some arbitrary symbols, right? It's, it's kind of arbitrary why we have the symbols we do. Uh, and then we could translate uh, this to, to this or whatever. Uh, I don't know what that example is about, but uh, there, there we go. And the, and the really interesting thing about, about this idea of isomorphisms is that uh, information uh, is, is, these symbols are, are useful. These isomorphisms between symbols are useful because at the end of the day, we're creating an isomorphism between an idea in our head and the values that represent that idea in the computer. And the best sort of data structure for an idea we have is one that is isomorphic to it because then we could perfectly express our idea inside of the computer. And we can interpret it back by sort of creating this isomorphism, right? So words are really isomorphisms between ideas. Uh, that's kind of what language is, right? Uh, at the end of the day, we have to run it on our internal brain machine to sort of, you know, uh, uh, pump out emotions and, and whatever sort of weird chemicals in our brain make us feel things. But we're going to do that by reading words, which we then process into ideas, which then make us feel certain things. And that's sort of how we interpret things. So yeah, it's uh, fancy, fancy stuff. Uh, but yeah, that's that's kind of what I want to go over to start with. Isomorphisms. I see a couple of chats. Kit, a type is not a set of values. Oh no, what is, uh, what is a set? Uh, what set is the set of values of any? In any case, type set is what? A set of all sets? Uh, well, that's, that is, that is true. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
Um, but for now, let's pretend that there are, uh, it's basically a set. There, it, for all intents and purposes, I hope this, this makes sense in, in most cases. Um, maybe, yes, maybe you had a, a set of all sets and all that sort of maybe contradictions, but let, let's, let's push that aside for now. It's just an exception, <laughs> but good point. Uh, okay, any other questions going on here? All right, nice. So uh, one thing I like to do uh, when reckoning with those sorts of strange ideas, because I'm not a mathematician, and clearly I already may have gotten something terribly wrong about set theory, uh, is, is put things into code where I can uh, you know, bang them on the compiler and, and run them and print line them and you know, get my hands on them, make them tangible to me with my coding brain. That symbols are kind of uh, uh, nebulous and difficult and un not tactile. So what we could do if we want to get an idea of this isomorphism is maybe make some kind of case class that is representation, that represents an isomorphism. So we can inside of it have these two functions, one going from A to B and another one going from B back to A. And obviously this could be any two types and it might not even make sense. So we're gonna to have to have tests for these to make sure that this actually satisfies those those laws that we were talking about where to after from is basically equal to uh, identity and from after two is also equal to identity for in this case, oh no, from after two. So if we, if we first call two and then we call from, then we're gonna go from A to B back to A and that should basically be the same A we started with. So that's just going to be the identity of A and this would be the identity of of B. So those things should be equal, but these laws, we have no way of expressing them when making case classes. We need test suites for these and, and quick check libraries, uh, property-based testing to make sure that it basically holds for many values and hopefully is correct. Uh, yeah, this isn't like a theorem prover Scala, so we can't do everything we want to. Uh, but yeah, nonetheless, it helps us get a bit of a grasp on this concept. So let me make a couple of isomorphisms now that we could look at some, some real ones. Uh, so one interesting one is an isomorphism between tuples. So a tuple of AB is isomorphic to a tuple of BA. And if we think about this in terms of uh, what information can you get out of these two types, we can realize that they're the same. From a tuple of AB, you can get out both an A as well as a B. And you can do the same thing with a tuple of BA, you can get back either an A or a B. So in terms of how you're viewing this structure, they are identical. You can get the same information out of them at the end of the day. Uh, cool. And that's kind of what defines them as isomorphic. So let's, let's, let's instantiate that idea by making an implicit def isomorphism given two types A and B. We're going to create an isomorphism of tuples. So we're going to have a tuple of AB is the same thing or is isomorphic to a tuple of BA. And really, we can just use the swap method on tuples to go back and forth each direction. So that is an isomorphism between tuples. Uh, and, and to prove it's correct, we can go over to this isomorphism spec where I've already secreted away a particular test for us. And let's see. Oh, let me make sure. Oh, I need one one last uh, thing here. I need to let's see if Copilot can create a little implicit summoner for us. Yes, it can. So smart. Okay, good. So now I have this uh, in, in Zio test. I have this property based test where we're going to generate some random instant strings, and then we're going to get ourselves a an isomorphism between tuples of int string as well as tuples of string int, and then we're going to tuple up our random int and string into a tuple. And then we're going to uh, give it that sort of uh, that identity function that's created by composing these two to and from functions together. So we're going to have our tuple, then we're going to turn it into the reverse, and then we're going to turn it back. So we're going to basically swap this tuple twice going in both directions and just make sure that that is correct for given a whole bunch of random ints and strings. Oh, and is this, is this sad for some reason? Uh, let, me, let me remove that type description there. That might break it for some reason. Okay. And we should see, yeah, it's, it's totally true. So we tested it with a whole bunch of values. Uh, and this was true in every case. Let me just do some side effecting here to just prove that we've been testing with a whole bunch of values. Yeah. So there's a whole bunch of crazy looking values that we tested it. And in every case, 
when we uh, ran ISO two and ISO from in sequence on that value, we got back to where we started from. Okay, so that's one example of an isomorphism. Another one uh, that's maybe a little more interesting than that is an isomorphism for isomorphism between options options of A and either's of unit and A. So let's take a look at what this would look like. So in one case, we need to go from an option of A to an either of unit A. So let's do this. So if we have a sum of A, we can just put that in a right. And if we have a none, well, we need an either of unit A. So we can just put a unit in there. Great, easy. And going the other way, if we have a left of what's going to be a unit, we can change that to none. And if we have a right of A, we can just put that in a sum. So these are essentially, they contain the same amount of information. It's, it's, it's laid out differently, just as this information is laid out differently in the tuple, but we have the same content in both of these types and we can swap them back and forth. One is just as good as another at a high level, maybe uh, convenience wise, we prefer an option rather than an either unit. Uh, it's still good that option exists. We don't want to delete that from the standard library just because technically it's the same thing or isomorphic to an, another structure. Um, they might be isomorphic, but they're not exactly the same. Uh, and so that might differ in terms of performance and also in terms of ergonomics. And that's what we care about here. So let's take a look that this is also true. Uh, so I have another test here that's doing the same exact thing, except with our isomorphism between an option int and an either unit int. And we're just testing this with a whole bunch of random ints. And oh, oh, oh. what have I done? Uh, ha, ha, ha. Type erasure. This has the same type after type erasure. Let me try this again. Option A, either unit A. Not really sure why that's sad. Missing parameter types. Okay, option, let's try this again. Option of A, option match. Maybe I screwed something up here. Perhaps someone sees the problem. And then- Daniel group. says, rename one of the ISOs. Oh my goodness. I give <laughs> them a name. Thank you, thank you, thank you. ISO option. Well, what a terrible, what a terrible uh, error message in that case. Uh, but thank you so much. Oh man, very grateful, grateful for the audience. Okay, let me um, go back like this then and see if that compiles. Thank you, Daniel, much appreciated. So yes, unsurprisingly, both of these hold up under scrutiny and it works correctly. So, okay, that's what an isomorphism is. It's uh, this relationship between two types, any two types with the same cardinality are going to be isomorphic. It's just a matter of figuring out how to translate between uh, the two uh, for every value of either type. Hopefully that makes sense. Uh, but please let me know if there are anything, any things I can clarify there. Okay. So we're going to put this idea on the back burner. We'll need this for further uh, concepts we're going to explore. But yeah, keep that in your brain. Okay. So the next idea that we're going to take a look at are folds uh, and what it means to be a fold. Uh, so dot fold. What is this? What does this mean? It exists on lots of types. So let's let's just look at some examples. Folds. So on a list, we have a fold, and here is the signature for fold. And let me command click onto this fella, and let me just yeah. So fold on a list takes uh, a z. So this this thing that you're trying to you're trying to collapse this list into a single summary value. So you've got to give sort of a starting summary value. And then this operation where you combine that starting summary value with each uh, element of the list. And so why does fold look like this? Uh, is it just arbitrary? Uh, is there some pattern we could follow to re-implement this type signature to figure out what this type signature looks like? And, and there is, uh, maybe we could look at a couple of examples. So I'm going to take this fold left signature and plop it right here. And let's put this next to uh, an implementation of, of list. So list looks like this. There's a covariant type parameter and there are two cases. There is the empty case 
list of nothing. And then there is the cons case. Obviously, it's the double colon in Scala, but we're just going to make it cons here. And this has a, a head, the value of a, and then it has a tail, which is a recursive call here. OK. So now if we analyze the structure, let me pull this method down here, actually. Uh, yeah, do some question marks. If we analyze and compare this function signature against the, the cases that we have for our list, we'll see that there's like an alignment here. Uh, so there are two different cases. And likewise, there are two different arguments to our fold. OK, that's an interesting observation, perhaps. And, but these arguments differ. And why do they differ? So in one case, uh, in the empty case, we just have a single uh, value, a single uh, B. So our summary value, the thing that we're interpreting our list into, that's what we put for the empty case. For the cons case, this takes two arguments and returns a value. So this is it really takes no arguments and returns just that summary value. So we could have written this perhaps like, like this. Um, maybe we wanted to make that a call by name parameter. But let's just do it like this so we can see the pattern exactly. So empty has no values. Therefore, it accepts no values to its function. It just returns the summary. The cons has two values, and it has two arguments to its function. Uh, this happens to be fold left, but maybe if we did fold right and flip the or order of these arguments, it yeah, might look a little more logical. A little more logical here, exactly. So the A, so this, this list contains an A, and that's one of the arguments to our function. And then where we have a recursive call, we use that same B summary value, and then we have to turn this into a B. So there is a pattern that we could basically follow, even if we don't understand why it looks like this. Uh, we, can, we can train someone, maybe a computer, to sort of me mechanistically uh, translate between these uh, sealed traits and these data structures. Ooh. Ah, yes. Yeah, this is just kind of a nice like trick. You can see this is kind of if you do one of these folds with the constructors, you get back the same thing here. So let's see if we can do this here. So if I fold right with list.empty and list.cons here, this should get me back the same thing. I'm not sure if it's actually sad. Is it sad? Let me compile. <laughs> Found list that empty type. Oh, because I needed this. I made it a function just to make oh. them. Uh, I made it all weird, but there we go. No, uh, there we, we go. got a call by name parameter instead, so we don't have to do yeah. that. Yeah. So, so that that's kind of a good way to tell if you've got like a kind of regular definition of one of these fold things. Mm -hmm. Is the fold should handle all the constructor parameters. So, if you fold and you feed back in the constructor parameters, you should get the same thing back. That is a great that is a great test uh, that you've done this correctly. Uh, so yes, one can imagine then if, if we have that rule, if we have this sort of guiding principle, we know we've we've gotten our fold right. Uh, we know we've gotten our fold correct once we are able to pass in the constructors to their corresponding arguments and basically get the identity function. So let's just quickly look at another example. So let's take a look at the fold. Uh, option has a fold as well. So let's make a seal trait option of A. So there's the, the none case, which is an option of nothing. And then there is the sum case, which is the option of a value. And the fold on option looks like this, where we're gonna have that same summary value. And we're gonna have to handle each of these cases. So let's, let's, let's sort of name them so we can just show the, the pattern here. So we're gonna say, we're gonna have to handle each case. If none, we're gonna just, none has no information for us. It has no arguments. So we're gonna have nothing to the left of our arrow. And we're going to have to return. Each of these is going to have to return a B, the thing we're interpreting the structure into. The next argument would be the sum case. So if sum, now there is an argument here, and it happens to be an A. So if we have a type uh, here that's not recursive, we're always just going to use whatever that type is. So in this case, it's in this, this generic A. So we're going to have a function from A, A to B. And then we're going to get back our B. And that should, that should work. Uh, and let's just make sure that this identity works. I like that that trick. So let's kind of do the same thing. Well, yeah, say def identity option. Let's make sure that sort of works. So I'll say option of A. 
So yeah, if we have an option, which is called A's here, because Copilot, I shouldn't have relied on that. So we have a, an option of A. We can fold over that, passing in the constructors uh, where they belong. And we're going to get back that same option that we started with. So mechanistically, you could basically go through each of the constructors of your type if you want to make a fold for it, one of these regular folds. Uh, each of these is going to accept the function, uh, though technically, if it has no arguments, it doesn't have to be a function. Uh, so you could, you could delete that in that case. But just to make them regular, once again, so each of them is going to accept a function that returns that summary value. So you're interpreting each case. You have to handle each different case and interpret it into the thing you're interpreting it into. Uh, and if it does have values, uh, you just basically make those the arguments. So it's going to have the same number of arguments as it does parameters. The only interesting case is if that were recursive, you replace that with uh, the, the, the summary value there. Basically, because in terms of its implementation, you're folding from the bottom up. And so anything that was recursive would have already been folded into that summary value. Uh, but yeah, that's kind of a, a mechanism you could, could do with this. So I hope that makes sense. You can now mechanistically uh, write a fold for any data structure and verify it uh, as, as Adam uh, showed here. OK. Whew. Next next step, let us take a look at one more fold. Let's take a look at a Boolean. How would we write a Boolean fold? Let's think about this. Case true, make our own Boolean here, and case false. Hopefully this doesn't break anything. No, I don't seem to have used Boolean anywhere yet. So what would it look like to fold a Boolean, given our pattern here? Well, we need two cases, the if true case and the if false case. Neither of them have parameters, so they're basically both going to be call by name parameters. So let's, let's do this. So we have the if true. We're going to have some summary value. So I'll just use a B again just to make it uh, um, regular with the others. And then we have an if false case. Then we're going to return the B. Interesting. So what does this look like to anyone? <laughs> does, this, does this ring any bells, the, the fold for Boolean? Any thoughts? Hey, it's an if, right? It's an if then else, basically. So this is if then else, except it's in sort of a, a method format uh, existing on the trade itself, instead of accepting it elsewhere. But yeah, uh, if, if is basically a fold over Boolean. Boolean is this entity, this type that has a cardinality of two. There, there are two decisions you can make, really. So when you interpret it, you have to handle each of those two possibilities. And so that's why the fold kind of looks like this. This is the Boolean is sort of the the least complex data type that is interesting at all. Uh, if we went down one level in, in terms of data types, we basically have uh, uh, case class unit, unit which just has no information, just is itself. So a fold on unit following this pattern would be this. And as you can see here, we're basically going to just be returning the thing you passed into it. So wherever you call this fold on a unit, you basically could just delete that fold and just replace it with B. You can inline it because it's not doing anything interesting whatsoever. Uh, it really doesn't give us any information at all. Um, there's that book, what is it? The Diving Bell and the Butterfly about a guy who sort of got in a car accident and became totally paralyzed from the neck down or maybe from every from like the, the eyes down, I think. He can only really uh, blink. But he wrote a book uh, called The Diving Bell and the Butterfly about his of life, just by, just by blinking, uh, teletyping through his eyes uh, to a stenographer and, uh, and wrote a book. But he was able to do that because he could at least blink. He could do something. He could uh, express some amount of information that was not just sort of a flat line uh, that unit is. Uh, no one in a coma, for instance, has ever written a book that's won any awards because they have no ability to uh, signal any real information. Uh, at least not that would be uh, an interesting narrative. Okay, that's a strange metaphor. But unit is kind of not very interesting. Boolean is the, the simplest data type that is actually uh, tells us something that we can interpret. Okay, so the next, the next stage, now that we have this Boolean, we're going to uh, move on from folds slightly. Or we're going to ask the following question. In our code, when we have uh, a data type, 
uh, such as Boolean. Let's just focus on Boolean now. What do we do with Booleans? We really, at the end of the day, if you desugar any function that accepts a Boolean, what, internally, if, it's, if it needs the Boolean, if it wasn't just accepting it to screw with you as a programmer, it's going to be calling fold. It's going to be calling if then else on it or some other language construct that internally is basically doing the same thing internally as if then else. If you keep desugaring it, it's, it's using it to make a binary decision. It's folding over that Boolean, which raises the question, perhaps, if the only thing you ever do with the Boolean is basically branch on it, would it be possible to get rid of the Boolean entirely altogether and just somehow branch on it? So can a Boolean be represented just as it's if then else, just as it's fold? And uh, uh, we are going to hope that the answer is true. And we're going to explore that idea a little bit. So let's make a version a different version of Boolean. Uh, basically, could we, uh, let's first make an example actually with this. So let's see, we have our Boolean. Uh, so let's see if we can make a function called, for instance, let's make this correct actually. So we're gonna have self up here. I know that's not necessary, but that's a total habit. Uh, so if it's true, oh no, if, if true, we're gonna say if true. And if false, we're going to say if false, great. So now we can do things like, um, for instance, turning this Boolean into a string. Uh, and that, that's another case where people probably maybe don't realize that if then else is being used, but clearly when you take a Boolean, a standard Boolean and interpolate it into a string, hello, true, like this or something, internally the string interpolator is going to have to pick which representation, which string representation of that Boolean to use. Uh, and so if we wanted to override uh, to string here, Clearly, it's going to, well, you could use a match, but <laughs> you could also use if then else, essentially, to decide that. And I think I, oh, override def to string. There we go. So that would work as well. So here I'm just going to uh, print line true is, and then I will inline boolean.true, and false is false. So it's going to internally, when we uh, string interpolate it here, it's going to call its two string method, which in internally is going to fold over that to decide uh, which representation to use. So really at the end of the world, when we keep desugaring all of these functions, the only way we're using a Boolean uh, is by calling that if then else. Okay, so now we have an example of using a Boolean in some way. So we can ask ourselves next, would it be possible to instead represent a Boolean not as this data form, but instead to basically make it its own fold function, to, to just express it as an if then else. Okay. So ideally, we could have some other Boolean, we can call it Coolian, and it would look like this. It would be a function from these two A's, maybe these two call by name parameter A's, but let's just leave that off for now, to a third A, right? It's it, really, that's what if then else is. It's a decision between two A's. Unfortunately, in Scala 2, there's no such thing as a polymorphic function type. So we basically have to pre-decide what we're going to interpret our, our, our Boolean into. So this Boolean, you can only use this in if then else statements that resolve to ints or something. That would be really, really annoying if you had to sort of do that. Uh, that would be really, really annoying. So uh, in order to sort of hack around this, we want to have this, we're going to have to use a little bit of a syntactic trick in Scala by making a trait instead, because methods can be polymorphic. So instead of doing this, which we would not want, we can now on this method have our A value, which would basically do the same thing. And maybe I will make these call by name just to show the similarity here. So I'm gonna say if true and if false. So this is basically an if then else as a, as a trait. It is the fold of a Boolean but we're gonna to try to see if we can treat this fold of a Boolean as the Boolean itself. So that's the pattern for it. Now we could look at maybe what would be these two core values be? What, what would it look like to have a true in this format? Well, clearly we're gonna to have to make a new Coolian and it's going to need the signature. And to guide us, we can say, all right, if this were a true and we called if then else with it, how would we implement 
this version of if then else. If it's if then else, but we happen to know it's true, what, what, what branch did we take? And of course we took the if true branch. So the definition of true in its function form, if you implement true as its own if then else, it simply just returns the true case and ignores the if false case. So it's a bit of a mind bender perhaps, but if we, let's take a look at false, it's gonna be literally the same thing, except we ignore the if true case and we return the if false case. So we're representing Booleans here as their own interpretation, as their own eventual inevitable interpretation, which is this fold, AKA if then else. So it is its own if then else. So we can, we're cutting out the middleman. If we were to define an if then else for this data type, so if then else for a Coolian, basically we would need a Coolian, then we need the if true, the if false. And all we're gonna be doing is calling itself with that. So we could, we could uh, uh, refactor this to remove this middleman and just use the Coolian itself. But maybe having this here, we'll keep this around. Maybe this will help us realize, uh, see a similarity between the other cases. Uh, because now we can do other things with this Coolian. Uh, let's try to string. So override def to string. Well, basically we wanna say Coolian dot if then else, this, and then true, false. So right, if, if we're true, do this. If we're false, do that. But of course, this if then else is just calling the cooling we passed in. So we can kind of remove this middleman and just do the apply method of this. So this, true, false, because we are our own if then else. So let's see if this, if this works. I'm going to go down here and now replace these with our Coolians, Coolian.true and Coolian.false. And it works just the same, which is kind of kind of cool. Um, and there's really nothing we cannot do here. Uh, we can add an and operator. So and, let's try and that Coolian. So we're going to take two Coolians and combine them. Well, once again, maybe it's easier to think in terms of if than else. So let's try it. Let's start with this. So if if this is true, uh, we'll do, we're gonna do one thing, but if this is false, we definitely know we're returning false. So that's that's obvious, right? They both have to be true. So if the, the top one is, is, is false, we're gonna return false. So now we can consider the middle case, that. So if that is false, we're also returning false, coolian dot false. But if, if this is if that is true, we're returning Boolean dot true. Great. And then we can simplify this because once again, these if and else's are sort of just pointless syntactic sugar. These are if and else, so we can just do this. Great. Uh, and I guess we could probably also simplify this because if we're interpreting that if it's true to be true and false to be false, that's kind of redundant, right? We can just say that. So it'd be another form of simplification, but just to keep the whole thing, maybe a little more readable uh, and less tricky. Oh, not my email, not this. There we go. <laughs> all right. So now we can do things like, uh, all right, let's print out uh, some more examples. Um, true and true is this. Let's just get Copilot to help us out. So yeah, true and true is true. True and false is false. False and true is false. False and false is false. So we have uh, Booleans with Boolean logic and it all works, uh, except that these are no longer data Booleans. These Booleans are functions. They are, we're representing Booleans as their own eventual interpretation, which is a really uh, kind of crazy mind bendy idea. Um, and this pattern, of representing a data type as its own interpretation is actually called a church encoding. So this would be a church Boolean, hence the, the C there. We weren't just being silly. Uh, so this church encoding is when you take a data type and you represent it basically as a Lambda, as just a function, as a value. And obviously in Scala, we have to add this trait just because we can't have polymorphic functions or polymorphic Lambdas. Um, so we need to have this extra degree of in indirection here, but really we're just representing this thing as a Lambda. 
And why is it called this? Well, Church uh, is, is someone's last name, a man named Alonzo Church, who came up with the lambda calculus, which is what all the functional programming is based on. As a other mini quick aside, the lambda calculus is basically what if a language only had lambdas? So what if you could only define functions like this? What if you can only define functions that took variables and returned variables? So you only had lambdas, these are called. You could call these things, so we can call this with something. And you obviously had these variables. So variables and lambdas and application, those are the three terms of the lambda calculus. So mathematicians like to take uh, sort of the minimal set of rules and find something interesting from there. So what is the simplest language we can have? And, and lambda calculus is one of these. And, and a whole bunch of crazy ideas come out of this, including if all you have is, is just functions, calling functions, and then just variables, you don't even have numbers. Can you do anything interesting? Well, it turns out that you can have data types. You can really do anything that you can do with ADTs by representing them in this crazy way as their own interpretation. So every, every piece of data, every ADT you can define, uh, every pure immutable value using sealed traits and case classes is going to be representable in a church encoding. Uh, we started with the simplest one that's interesting, which is this Boolean. But we can also sort of do this mechanistically. Uh, basically, let's, let's move up to our option. Let's make a church option. The pattern is this. If you want to make a church version of any type, just as we sort of looked at the way of, of making a fold for any type, is you take the fold. So we're going to, I just copy that fold. And let's actually implement this. So we can, we can do that here. So I'm going to self-match. So if none, we're going to use the if none case. If some, we're going to pass it along to our function. OK, so now we have an implementation. All right, so our church option, church option is going to be parameterized uh, by, uh, no, it's, uh, it's going to be parameterized by an A. Actually, it has to be because this one actually, Boolean doesn't have any type parameters, but if we want this to be the same type, it does have a type parameter. And then our definition of fold is going to, well, I'll just paste this in. Nope, that's cyberge tech. There we go. It's going to be the same, except we're just going to call this apply because it is its own fold. And then we can go to our companion object and we can see how to make the constructors. So none is going to be a new church option of nothing. You know, no, no. <laughs> should, I should disable uh, this thing sometimes. Um, but it is helpful in other cases. So let's implement this. So clearly this one's going to just be, it's, it's if none case. We could basically look at how we're pattern matching and that's, this is gonna be the implementation because we are its own interpretation. We don't need to match in ourselves. We are our interpretation. So we could just basically implement each case as the branch corresponding to whichever case we're implementing. So I'm going to copy this because this is basically going to be the implementation of the sum case. But of course, the sum takes a value. So we're going to have a value of A here. And let me just let this complete it because I can figure it out. Cool. So the, the, the church encoding of a sum case is going to take this value that we have and call the if sum case with it. It's just going to store this value, sort of close over that, and, and eventually when it's interpreted, call if sum with that value. And it's still a function, it's still a lambda, and we can write every combinator we could with a normal option with this, this churchified version uh, because we have access to our, our fold function. So as we can implement basically any version of any option method with, with fold uh it's quite a powerful operation so we can go through and, and implement you know is empty and is is some and whatever we're not going to go into that right now but basically we just have to figure out how to implement these with fold and then we can we can do that um uh yes i don't want to return okay let's let's try this okay let's actually have it return a church boolean so let's keep everything churchified i, I can't resist so we're going to take if this then uh church boolean true so no church boolean true uh, and if false, we're going to throw away the result because you don't care about it. Sorry, if sum, we're going to throw away the, the value we have and just return false because is empty should return true in the case that it is empty. And then we can sort of do is defined. Hopefully you can figure it out in the opposite way. Yay. And this is all going to work just the same. So once you've built up a few layers of abstractions, we can almost forget that this is implemented just in terms of functions. Uh, though it, certainly if you sort of inline all of these, it's going to look really 
confusing. It's just going to be this huge lambda of other lambdas, accepting lambdas, returning lambdas, but it still is useful. So now we looked at a couple of patterns like this. Hopefully you can sort of figure out that really, if you want to do this mechanistically, you can take a fold for a data type and then make a new trait and give it one method apply where its signature is basically that fold. And then each implementation of each data type is just the branch of the original implementation corresponding to that data type. So you could, we could probably write some algorithm that churchified all of our data types for us if that were, if that were useful. Um, that's a ho homework if anyone wants to write that macro for some reason or, or scholafix rule, right? Just a, a fully churchified code base. Uh, do, do it at your job for sure. Um, okay, so now that we've come this far, now we're gonna reach back to the, where we started, which was that idea of isomorphisms because the church encoding is isomorphic to the data type it represents. Let us prove this. So let's have an, uh, a Boolean church iso. So I'm gonna make a new isomorphism between the regular Boolean, well, our data type version of Boolean and the church Boolean. And I'll just let Copilot do its thing because it's correct. And it's not too interesting here, right? We're just sort of doing a one-to-one -one mapping between these values. One happens to be represented as its own encoding, uh, but that's, that's okay. It's its own, its own fold, but whatever. We can translate these. Oh no, this is not gonna work. <laughs> that's not gonna work at all. Cause we can't, technically if this function has an identity we can match on it, but that's, that's not really the way to do this. Sorry about that. So yes, church Boolean, but it is its own if then else. So we just call it like this. If this were true, we return the data type true. If this is false, we return the data type false. So we can't match quite on these things. Uh, that's one limitation, but it's only because the language doesn't al allow that sort of thing. Um, but theoretically, these are equal in every other sense. We can always translate between our, from our church Boolean to our actual Boolean data type and then match on that. These are truly as good as one another at a theoretical level. Um, and this would, we could write tests for this and this, this would totally uh, pass them. And same with our, our uh, Let's see if I can get it to just automatically write one between uh, val option church ISO. Figure it out. Did it do it? <laughs> no. <laughs> no. Uh, that's, that's probably my fault because this needs to be an option church ISO of, of A. And then maybe I can figure it out. Come on, you got this. Oh, so close. Uh, so what is wrong with this? That's actually almost correct. So we're matching on option none, changing it to this changing sum into this, uh, the church option, that should work. I think maybe it's just that I have a, I have a double parameter list here for some reason. And therefore I have to make sure that this is going to get us back an option of A. Cool. Yeah, that, uh, so this is also isomorphic. So uh, the, the church encoding and the non-church encoding, the data encoding are identical. Are there any questions we've been going over? <laughs> More people want to see piano numbers. <laughs> uh, all right, we can, do, we can do piano numbers. I, yes, let's take a look at uh, piano numbers. Um, so if you don't know what piano numbers are, they are sort of a, a way of representing natural numbers as, uh, as a data type. So piano, you can count zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, et cetera. So let's take a look at this real quick. So we need two cases and I'll just let this do its thing. So we have two cases. We have the zero case. This represents our base case is the number zero. And then we have this successor case, which is generally called suck uh, for some reason, which contains the previous piano number. And yeah, I'm actually gonna call it, sometimes these are also referred to as nets for natural numbers. So I'm gonna do that because it's a little terser. And this isn't parameterized by anything. So we have these two cases, zero, and then uh, the successor of the current number. So I will say that to my dictionary. And then we can sort of just show off that, well, one would basically be the successor of zero. Two would be the successor of one, which is the successor of zero, et cetera. So three is this and so on and so forth. So we can represent these numbers with a data type. It's pretty strange, but it works. We're using this inductive data type to represent natural numbers. So we have to start at some base case, which is chosen to be zero here, which means we can might make a fold out of this using the patterns that we, we know. So we want to fold to some summary value. I'm just going to keep the B. 
We have the if zero case, which is just going to have to get us our B. And then we have the if successor case. And as we know, if we have a recursive call, the way we turn this into a function is we need it to return B always. Everything returns B. And if it has no arguments, it's just a function to B or a call by name parameter to B. And then if it does have an argument, you're going to use that type unless it's recursive. And if it's recursive, you use the same type. So we'll have B there again. So yeah, if suck, we are going to have a function from B to B. And that's basically it. And let's match on this. So if zero, we're saying if zero. And then if suck, we're going to call if suck on taking the, uh, <laughs> the recursive nat and recursing on this with the same stuff. Uh, so that might seem a little strange, uh, but let us actually then use these things. So let's do some interesting fold. I can make a, maybe a method here called to int. And the way this is going to work, we're going to fold over it. And yeah, well, this is correct. <laughs> we're going to uh, start with zero. And then for each, uh, if it's a successor, we're just going to add one to the previous one. So now we can translate this uh, sort of ADT version of a natural number to an integer. So let's do a uh, print line nat dot four to, uh, to not to string to int and make sure that's correct. And we'll do the same thing with two. And I'm going to, oh, missing parameter for, I'm just going to comment this out. That's not important anymore. And I'm going to do the same with this. Okay, yay, four and two. So that's that's a that's a natural number, and uh, we can turn it into. Uh, and sometimes these are known as piano numbers, and we can fold over them to turn them into ints. And of course, to complete the cycle, we can create a church version of the natural number, which is just to show this pattern one more time. We copy paste its fold. We name it apply in the companion object. We make a val for each case. So val zero is going to be a new church nat, and its implementation is going to be the copy pasting of the uh, that case that we matched on before, because it is its own interpretation. And so I'm going to uh, copy this. Do val. No, this would have to be a, a, a def. So if it takes arguments, you still need to accept those arguments. So if this is, if this accepts an argument, we're going to have the def look basically just like that. So that's another thing I didn't quite specify previously. So this, the constructor has an argument. This is going to have an argument. And this is going to basically be equal to a new church nat, not to int, copilot. We're just going to call if suck on the previous nat. Let's copy the implementation here. So we don't even have to think about it. We just copy the implementation that you had before. And if you, if you use fold anywhere, well, uh, this has to be a church net. And then anywhere you use fold just becomes apply because we happen to rename it. Uh, maybe it's clearer if, if we do not rename it, but yeah. So now we have a church version of the same thing and we can uh, have the number two. It's as, uh, now just like this and, and four and everything we had previously. Uh, and it should work just the same. I can even copy this method to int onto here and just replace fold with apply. And now I can go to church nats and all the code will work just the same. Yay. Oh, three and two. Oh no, I screwed up four. That's because I think it implemented this incorrectly. It implemented it as, as three. There should be, there should be four there. Copilot. Uh, it helps me go fast, even if it makes things a little crazy sometimes. Uh, yes. So I hope that's the one last example of that. Uh, great. And we have uh, 35 minutes to get even crazier. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, oh, no, to be sorry. That was fun. Uh, I'm not sure why I said sorry, but uh, we were probably just joking if we said yeah, yeah. Words. <laughs> no, no, uh, we, we just like to throw things at, at Kit, you know, when, when you see like, oh, that was really great. Let's just have him do some more. <laughs> have him do some numbers too. What <laughs> a type system. No, but I actually, I was thinking yeah, about going right. through <laughs> So thank you for that. Um, uh, okay. So we, we talked about isomorphisms. We've talked about how we can sort of mechanistically write a fold and that a fold is basically a way of extracting all of the information that a type holds and translating it, reinterpreting that type. Um, basically you can think of data 
as sort of a, some suspended version um, of an interpretation. So instead of interpreting, instead of interpreting early, we're going to uh, suspend it in this data format, which we can then, when we're ready, fold over and finally interpret it into its final state. Um, and all data types really are only as good as their final interpretation. As programmers, like we deal with data a lot, but at the end of the day, we want to actually make some impact on the real world. Uh, we're going to interpret every data, every piece of data, even if that is uh, by rendering it to the console. We're interpreting it as a string, which is then going to be interpreted as pixel values, which is then going to be whatever uh, charged up on the pixel, however computer screens work. I don't know. That's where my falling uh, <laughs> knowledge completely falls apart. But, but really, everything is eventually going to be interpreted if it's of any use to us at all. Otherwise, it's just sort of sitting there in the computer taking up a pointless, pointless room. Uh, and often to make our lives easier, we go through various stages of transformation, transforming this piece of data to that piece of data to that piece of data before we finally fold that, that final piece of data into our target, whatever that is, some uh, Excel uh, document or, uh, or web page or, or whatever, um, uh, console feed. Um, but yeah, the data itself really is only good for eventually interpreting it. And as we learned, the data basically can be its own interpretation. So there's really no reason to have that data at all, except that it is useful to suspend interpretation. That is a useful thing. It makes our code uh, easier to read. Um, you don't have to go directly to the final form all the time. And you can have multiple stages where you interpret it partially or reinterpret it in different ways. But as we mentioned, this is also a, uh, an isomorphism. So you can go both ways. So you can go from uh, data and, and church encoded into its own interpretation, or you can take methods and you can actually turn them into data. So you can take functions and instead of having them be interpretations, you can turn them into data. I mean, obviously we show this already in this case where, uh, well, I deleted them because they weren't compiling for some reason, but the isomorphisms between say uh, a church Boolean and a regular Boolean, that's bidirectional. That's the definition of an isomorphism. So if we started with this fold as a function, this, this, this church, uh, let me go to church Boolean. If we started with this trait essentially, which is a function, we were able to take this trait and turn it into sort of a, a reified data form, which is actually pretty useful because you can match on it. Uh, it it's, I would think maybe a little more in, uh, intuitive to, to work with, especially as you have other data types like options and either's. It just feels better. It feels more tangible than just all these crazy looking compositions of, of lambdas of their final interpretations. So it's good to be able to do that. And now with our final uh, bit of time here, our final half hour, we are going to actually look at why this is practical, despite all being, I think, very fascinating and sort of uh, holy in some, some, some way. There's a lot of meaning here, this relationship between these, these two things. Uh, how is this practical? And I'm going to try to first sketch out the idea of why it's practical, and then we'll look at a, a concrete use case that, I, that this has helped me and, and seems to help me more now that I sort of understand what's happening instead of just accidentally stumbling upon it. OK, so often our programs are of, of some shape like this, right? We, we have some input, input, and we want some output. Uh, and I'm just representing that here with the function arrow, so our input and our output. Uh, and sometimes in our programs, we actually take the same input and we interpret it into different forms of output. So we have some starting data and we want to get, you know, uh, interpreted into some final expression, but then we also want to query other bits of information about this. So there are two different C's here, C and C prime. And oftentimes this might actually be pretty difficult. I'm going to make this arrow really long to simulate how difficult it is to get that final piece of information. Wow. If only uh, all function arrows uh, looked like that. Okay. However, there could be some other type, maybe that sits along here, some other orchestration of information that's actually quite trivial to get that final piece of information out. One could imagine it takes a quite a long time to go from A to C, but there's actually some other data type where it's really easy to just query the answers from. So what often ends up being the case in algorithms is that there's another path where you can go instead to B. And maybe it's actually a bit of a shorter path than to go to those other answers. And so if you sort of 
need to, at the end of the day, get, get C and C prime here instead of having one function F and one function uh, F prime that takes A to C and A to C prime, you might instead call G and then maybe this uh, H function and H prime function on that. So you first call G and then once you have this result of B, you can then call these two functions to get your answer. And if we sort of sum the total paths to the end by calling F and F prime, we're gonna get this really long arrow. But if we want to do this uh, composition of G and H and H prime, First, we turn it into uh, an A to a B, and then we take these two little arrows. Yay. And we end up uh, sort of optimizing our code. All very abstract <laughs> right now. Um, we're gonna take a look at a very concrete example of this. Uh, what this in-between value ends up being a lot of the time because it could be difficult to see like what, what structure do I need to make these, these easy to solve for me, ends up being often, you can, you can find this by figuring out potentially the data representation of a function. So we, before we were going from data to uh, functions with the church encoding, but there's this other way of going from functions to data. We could basically analyze what is happening in this big complicated function. What operations are we doing in order to construct our final summary value here? And then instead of just actually performing those operations, let us instead turn that idea, take that function and so-called defunctionalize it, turning it in, into some data form. And that ends up being this B value, which we can then fold over generating the actual results uh, in a much simpler way, instead of having to sort of repeat that in-between work. We're factoring out some middle point, which is going to be some piece of data that represents kind of the structure of our computation in data form. We're suspending interpretation a little early, which allows us to then reinterpret to this final endpoint really quickly and conveniently later. Okay, that, and that seems, I hope that general strategy uh, maybe makes sense, but in order to give ourselves an actual example, I will now quickly code up uh, the way I uh, sort of reckoned with this and thought about this and kind of motivated going down this, this rabbit hole, um, which was in, uh, I made some macros a while ago uh, for Z layers. Um, uh, so I made a library called Zeomagic. And basically the purpose of this was to uh, simplify the construction of these dependency graphs. So uh, a little brief recap on, on Z layers. They basically are uh, a way of building some service, some service uh, out given maybe a bunch of dependencies. So A and B. So this service C depends on uh, A and B services in the environment. And you're gonna, so that's, let's call this layer C. And then you might have a, a layer B that depends on D in order to make uh, B. And you might have layer A just has no dependencies and it just gives you uh, the result there. And same with, same with D. So we have all of these ways of building particular dependencies of our applications. We call these layers and they have some output type. That's the thing that's finally generated. Uh, and you might have a program that depends on C and you want to be able to basically uh, plug and play and, and decide different uh, ways of maybe building, providing its dependencies. So you can have different versions of this layer B, one that depends on on D, one that depends on nothing, et cetera. And you get to compose these together on the fly. This composition ends up looking something like this, where you have the thing that you're trying to add the dependencies to on the right-hand side, the layer. And then for each of its dependencies, you have to compose these together in this, in this format. So I've got to, th this needed B and A. So I'm gonna have A and B like this. But of course, because B has its own dependency, we'll now need to provide layer D to this one. So you get this sort of graph structure that's uh, sort of flat and maybe a little awkward. <laughs> um, so the idea for this macro is instead of, of doing all of this stuff by hand, it's kind of a deterministic graph search that we, we just performed. We said we knew we wanted C. And so we just have to look through all the layers that we have and figure out um, which ones to choose based on what we're looking for. We needed B, so we're gonna pick this one that had B as its output, but this one needed D. So we needed to find another layer that provided D as its output and we could use that. 
and so on and so forth to build this thing. But it's pretty deterministic. So the idea of the Z layer, uh, this macro, is to just basically say, I want to build C, please. C layer dot make, make myself a C here. And then I can just dump in all these layers, just put them all on the floor, layer B, layer A, in any order we want to. And this macro is going to analyze the, the types of these things because they're typed by their dependencies. And it's going to basically generate at compile time spit out instead the code you would have written by hand. So at compile time, the whole point of a macro is taking some code as sort of an abstract syntax tree and then replacing that with a different abstract syntax tree. So we're taking this code almost as a string, though it's an AST, and then replacing that in your code base, this whole thing in your code base with this new code string. Okay, that's the Zio, that's what Zio magic did, which is now part of Zio2. And it's this, uh, you can call zlayer.make or you can call provide in an effect. I'm assuming maybe most people know what that is because we've already talked about it, but just to sort of show off what the algorithm is for deciding this, um, that's kind of the process. And so in order to do this, I, I made a, a graph type because this is kind of a graph traversal problem. We have some target and we have some, uh, some inputs. So let's quickly throw ourselves together some types. So the inputs are types. So A, B, C, these are all these different types, which we'll just represent as strings for now because we're not actually gonna write a macro. Uh, and then we have these layers, these layer ex expressions. These are the ASTs of our layer. So it's like a, it's literally the thing that the user wrote. And we're going to take these and reorganize them. But for now, we're just going to treat these experts as just strings as well, uh, just to show off the problem. So we're not actually going to be doing macros. And then we have this graph type. This graph type has inside of it a list of nodes. Nodes. So a node, what is a node? A node is a list of all the inputs, which is a list of types. It's a list of the outputs, outputs, list of types, because layers can actually output more than one type. And then it has the actual expert of that layer. So layer C would be represented as, so object examples. I'll have a layer C node. Hopefully this can figure it out. It can, isn't that crazy? Um, <laughs> so the layer C node is this node where uh, basically uh, layer C had this type of Z layer from uh, A with B, nothing, and then C. This is the error type. Let's just ignore that altogether. So it had this input and this output. So in this data form that we can work with, we've used macro magic to turn these types into lists of the individual types. So we change this intersection type into the individual types, and we have some output here. Cool. So that's that's what our node looks like. All right. This is, this is fun. 20 minutes. We totally have this. <laughs> it's going to be a little exciting. So our goal is to build a layer for some given output types. So we're going to have a list of, this is our target. So in our case, our target was basically just a list of the type um, C. And it's going to try to build ourselves a, a, a layer. So the first version was basically, yeah, I want to build a, a final expert from this. That's kind of what the thing I need. I need, I need this thing. I need to build this, and I'm going to uh, inline it. Uh, I, you know, I'm going to take the result that I get here, and then that's going to be the result of my macro. And that this is going to get replaced with the final expert that I generate. So that's our goal here. Let's see how we can implement this very quickly. Well, uh, we're going to have to for each node in our target. So let's, let's just map over these for each, each target value. We're going to have to find a node. So let's say find a node for that type. So if we're looking for C, we want to find a node in our list of nodes that has an output of that, which is going to start by finding the layer C here in this case. And then for each of that node's dependencies, we're going to have to find the nodes for its dependencies and so on and so forth. So let's quickly make a find node for a given output type, this will return, let's say, an option of a node, because uh, it, it might not work. And, and actually, to, to, um, to simplify, oh, I'll return an option of a node. So this is pretty easy. We're just going to say nodes.find outputs contains output. So we're going to find the first node that contains the type we're looking for in its output. And now we have a list of options of nodes. Great. Cool. Um, good, good. But now that we have this, 
what do we need to do? Yes, we have this node. Okay, uh, so let's 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 match. Actually, instead of doing an option, I'm going to throw. <laughs> I'm going to throw <laughs> just, just to make this slightly simpler. So we're going to pretend we have to have all the information here. Okay, so we're finding this node. Once we have it, val node. Then we want to basically build uh, the expert for each of its inputs. So the dependencies. So node dot inputs map build. Uh huh. And this is going to be. This should be a list of experts. And then the way this is going to work is we basically want to let's write some code like this. If node is an expert, oh a node dot expert node dot. Uh, Find node, yeah, that's a node. And a node has a method called expert on it, yes. We're going to take these dependencies and we're going to sort of uh, uh, concatenate these. So fold uh, left, um, I'll, say, I'll say reduce on these. And we're just going to want to plus plus these together and then zip them into this guy. Uh, okay. <laughs> it's getting a little complicated. Apologies. So uh, plus plus, I'm going to define this on an expert to just basically return a string like this. And arrow, arrow, arrow is going to basically do this. Uh, so self string plus that, self string arrow that. Good. OK. So does this compile? OK, almost, except nodes does not work here. Multiple implementations for map. That's not quite right. Um, let me see why. T build. Oh, because it takes a list of T. Yes. OK, good, 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 good. Uh -huh. I guess, though, in that case, I could just say build um, node.inputs, because it, it accepts a list. Uh, I might actually do it like this. Okay. <laughs> Apologies. All right. So now we have this list of experts, and we basically need to do the same thing where we take uh, this this results um, val results results, and we're going to uh, I'll just call reduce again. So we're cutting some corners to make this slightly simpler, even though I realize it's probably a little complicated already. Um, and we're gonna yeah fold it. So let's see if this code works. Um, with the example that we have. So I have the layer C node. I also need the layer B node, which depended on D. Then I'm going to have the layer A node, which had no dependencies. And I'm going to have the layer D node, which also had uh, no dependencies, just provided the D as its output type, and so on and so forth. OK, so now theoretically, I don't think that'll collapse. Cool. Now we can make a, a graph, which is going to basically have all of these nodes in it. And then our main function, we're going to print out the result of building the output C. And it blew up. Great, great. Uh, uh huh. Reduce left empty. Okay, because some of these have empty dependencies, of course. And that, that's why the, this whole reduce thing is probably not great. So I'm going to say if dependencies on it is empty, we're just going to uh, return the node itself. Otherwise, we're going to uh, provide its dependencies to it. Uh, other way around, node.exper. Let's try this again. <laughs> this is the wrong area. Okay, let's try this again. And there we go. Okay, so let's see. Uh, we have expert C, uh, expert B. Ah, oh, almost there. Because I need to call uh, do, do, do. down here. Let me see. So I'm saying just that, but really I want to say that.string. That dot string, and this is also going to be that dot uh, string. Okay, let's try this one more time. So give me the number output again. And there we go. We have a into d to b to c, and it's wrapped in this expert. So I'm just going to call string on it, and that's basically the code that I had previously. Where was this? Except each of these has been re uh, replaced with this just letter. So I think that's because I screwed up here. This should be layer c. This should be layer B. This should be layer A. And this should be layer D. And now if I run this, we should see that this is basically a string that represents 
the layer composition. Uh, and this is basically exactly how the, the macro works, except instead of being strings, these are ASTs. So these are actually, we would be constructing new abstract syntax trees with the quasi-quoting syntax and all that sort of stuff. But it really is a relatively simple graph traversal algorithm. Now, maybe a little too complicated. It's only <laughs> six lines of codes. Uh, obviously, this is partial and it blows up and it doesn't report any nice errors about missing layers. That's kind of where that adds another 20 or 30 lines of code to the actual implementation. Uh, but feel free to look at this. But the problem, bringing us to our actual uh, goal here, is that I also wanted to do other things with this, not just build the final expert, because I also wanted to be able to report these nice error messages. And one of the things that I need to do to do this is to get all of the unused data types. So I might have the same sort of idea, but instead of uh, returning a final expert, instead what I want to do is return all of the types or all of maybe the, uh, the layers, all of the nodes that just weren't used in the construction of this final layer graph. Because I might have provided some extra nodes, some nodes like a layer D, the layer uh, Z node, something else. No, that's not quite right. Let's say layer Z. And this had type X and was just never, never used by anything at all. Uh. <laughs> cool. So if I add this here, we're not going to see layer Z in our final outputs. And let me let me comment this out real quick. So yeah, we still don't see layer Z here, even though we're including it. And if it's included here, that means that the user, when they wrote their macro code, would have included layer Z up here. But they it was not used. So we want to give a nice warning to the user saying that, hey, you don't really need this layer Z here. So I kind of wanted another method that could tell for me uh, the list of nodes. But if we think about what needs to happen here, this is that these are both, this is kind of a complicated situation. This is that really long arrow. And we kind of have to do almost the same thing again here in order to, in order to figure out unused. We're going to need to sort of build the tree again uh, to, and, and keep track of some weird stuff. In fact, it's going to be pretty, maybe even more awkward to, to, to write this function. Um, so instead of doing this, which we could, but we're just going to realize it would be pretty difficult and maybe even more difficult than the, the one above, we're going to try to see if we can replace what we're doing here with some kind of data representation. So the first step would be to identify in this, maybe this build method, wh what's our summary value? Our summary value here is this expert type. So maybe one way of forcing this is to, instead of dealing with this expert type directly, uh, what if we had maybe some, every time we're doing an operation on the expert type, instead of doing that, pull these, those operations into the, the type signature up here, perhaps, just to, to sort of realize, to make it generic over this. So the only things we're doing with expert really are plus plus and uh, this, this triple uh, arrow thing. So that's, that's the functionality we have. If we wanted to sort of express this as a, as a trait, we could sort of maybe say uh, layer-like or something like this. We can, make a, we can make a type class for this, where the things you want to do with the layer-like thing are, uh, well, you want to concatenate them like this. So you have the left-hand side A, the right-hand side A. That's going to be one thing. And you also have the arrow. And then technically, in, the, in this case, I did, I did reduce. Um, uh, I did this is empty, but to be safer, I, I probably would want to do a fold left, in which case I need to have an empty value as well. Um, so an, I want an expert here, and I'm going to have to have some kind of empty value. So really, for now, I could just do expert of an empty string. Uh, but there is some secret value here. If I wanted to make this more correct, I think that's a layer like also potentially has an empty value may or may not uh, need it in this case, but uh, just, to, just to start with uh, making that, uh, let's actually go back to the other version. <laughs> so in, in reality, it does have an empty value uh, in, in at least the real implementation. Okay, we got this. So we could replace this with uh, sort of, we can have this work on anything that uh, was layer-like instead. So I'm actually going to do this by saying, okay, let's have this be layer-like. This will work on anything that's layer-like. Uh, of course, this isn't going to just be a list of nodes anymore. These nodes have to be parameterized by some type of A. So not just an expert, 
We want this to work on anything that is layer-like. Before we sort of knew it was an expert, but we can make this abstract now. So this is going to get us a node of A, and this is going to get us a node of A, et cetera. But now we cannot just call these methods on the things because there's going to be some A, and we can't just do uh, arrow, 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 or, or this stuff. But we can if we have a layer like. So let me go to implicit layer like, layer like of A. OK. So everywhere we were using operations that now no longer compile, I'm going to replace it with uh, this trait. So uh, let's see. So here, arrow, 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 I will say layer like dot arrow, arrow, arrow. And just make that a. I could make this an infix function by adding some implicit syntax, but let's just do this instead. Layer like dots plus plus, and then here once again layer like dot plus plus. Great. So now we're getting back an A instead of an expert. Fine. Which means we can get this to work with anything layer like. Of course, there is no layer like implementation for expert, but we could very trivially trivially make one. So I'm going to go down to companion implicit val layer uh, layer like equals new layer like for this expert type, and of course we basically already defined these methods. It's going to be um, left plus plus right, and then left arrow arrow right. So now that we have this, we can go back and run this function again. I think there might be some compilation error somewhere. Ah yes, uh, because this is a layer a list of a's now. So now it's, now it's actually totally generic, uh, which is kind of cool, but it still works because we've just taken all of the, the pattern of usage for this thing and pulled it out into a, uh, a trait. Okay. And why we did this was to make it a little more obvious how we were using the thing. Because now is the step that we can actually transform it. So just like before, where we first pulled out this, we identified this fold structure, that helped us implement the church encoding by sort of figuring out this trait and the, the patterns of operations that we used on the type that we were generating um, and, and, and changing it to be abstract, we can now translate this trait into data. So here's sort of the, the final bit. So instead of this, we're going to have uh, a seal trait. We're gonna make a data form. And the way this is going to work, now let's get this name first, seal traits. I'm gonna just call this, I'm just gonna call this layer because I haven't used that term yet. Um, so for each of the methods, we instead basically create an abstract syntax tree for them. So it's, it's, it's sort of a similar me mechanistic operation. I will, I will describe the steps though. So for each method, we create a, a case class if it has arguments. So I'm gonna call this um, uh, horizontal. This is horizontal composition. And if it's referring to uh, the A value here itself, essentially, we're going to make this recursive right layer, and then vertical is basically the same structure. The only problem with this though, is that uh, <laughs> there's really no way to build this because it's only recursive cases. Uh, and there's no way of really having any values other than layers in here. So in order to make this useful, we're also going to give it a type parameter. So all of these are going to get type parameters, layer of A. And then we're gonna add one other special case that's going to finish this, this thing, which is going to be a value. And this is going to be like a little place where we can have any value pretend to be a layer and ride along on this, on this layer data type with us. So this kind of represents the implicit A that you just had in this layer like trait, layer like trait. Like because it's a trait, we know we're defining it for some type that already has a way of being constructed somehow. But because this is just a piece of data, we sort of need a way of letting values uh, enter this, this abstract syntax tree for this trait. And now we can do the final transformation, which is to delete the trace. We don't want the type class, doesn't help us here. But of course, we instead want uh, to be able to use our other types. So what we're gonna do here is we want to instead return a layer of A, which means down here, instead of uh, doing a list of, of T, that, which is that, uh, oh, where, where do I generate the final? Um, so yeah, uh, ooh, one sec. Okay, so let me, let me add some methods to make this easier. So I can do, I can do plus plus on a, on a layer, which will take that of a layer of A, and I could do 
horizontal. And then, oops. Vertical, this, that. Is that set? Oh, yes, no, I need to say A1 widened. So I'm just adding some syntax to make this slightly easier. Okay, four minutes. Let's see if we can get to the end. Okay, and that's obviously sad for some, oh, this has to be A1, great. Okay, so now we have some syntax in this that maybe we can use. So in this case, I want to, I can go back to using plus plus. Um, but now that I have the A here, what I need to do is, is wrap this in this layer value type to lift this into a layer. But if we've done that, now when I reduce the dependencies, we can arrow them together like this. And I can say, this is now going to be a list of, when we call build, we get a list of layer of A. Cool. And then here I can just do plus plus again. So we're sort of back to the original version, which is kind of nice. Um, the, only, the only difference between this and what we had originally is that I'm wrapping this result into this, this layer value. So I had some value of A and I need to lift it into this AST. And now that we have this layer type, we can solve our problem. So when I, when I, when I print this, what we're going to get back is this structure. Uh, plus plus is not a member of any. No, no, no. Uh, list of any. Oh, no. List of, it should be a list of layer of A. Ah, oh, yes, because I need to say layer dot value there. Okay. And when I run this, we're going to get back this weird data type that basically represents the structure of the computation that we performed, but it's suspended. It, we're not actually collapsing it into our final value. We're not losing the information that we had as we went along. We're suspending it here. And if we have suspended data, how do we finally interpret it? Well, we do the same thing that we've been doing all along. We go up to this data type here and we define a fold method for it. And we can use the same sort of generic pattern that we did before, where we look at each case. So we have uh, if horizontal, and this is going to go from two recursive calls. So it, it's going to be BB to B. There's going to be if vertical, which is also going to be BB to B. And then there's the case where you want to have if value, which is just contains an A. And we're going to have to go from A to B. So A to B. And if I quickly implement this, self-match, horizontal is going to just call if horizontal and then recursively call itself uh, if vertical. And then value is going to call itself like that. And that should theoretically work. Uh, oh, no. If, oh, yeah, that's screwed up. Uh, if horizontal, I need to pass all the things. If is vertical, if uh, we need a comma there, it's, I think it's screwing up one of these. Let's try that one more time. Oh, because I need to give this a type. There we go. And now I should figure that out. Left fold is vertical. Oh, if vertical type is now, oh, because I made a weird tuple thing. Okay, good. So now we have a fold that just goes through our data structure. It's a pretty boring um, traversal through our, our data structure. And now we can reconstitute everything we had previously and, and, and finish this off in just one more minute. So we have the final layer structure, this sort of suspended layer, and we can call fold on it to get back the final expert. Because what do we do? Well, the value in here is, if we remember, we want to get back an expert. The value is an expert. So the first thing we have to do is a function from expert to expert. So I could just do identity. And then in order to compose these things, I can do, I have, they have the same operation. Oh, sorry, this needs to be a separate parameter list. So identity, and then we have these two things. And now if I render this expert, we have the expert, just like before, which we can get string out of. But also we can get values like unused out of this. So I can say val unused, which would, uh, oh, I guess I do need all the layers I used to build a thing in the first place, technically. So let me instead do uh, used. This will be a little easier to, to write on this. I could say val used. So this is going to be a fold of list of types. Fold on, uh, I want to get back a list of types. So, uh, oh, technically, okay. I think I need to have the, uh, the types in here then. So I think I need to make this return uh, the nodes instead, which is totally fine. Um, 
let, let me let me just for now just have a list of list of the final experts. So I'll just do identity um, uh, inside of a list. So this would be a list of experts then. Oh. Oh no, uh, a list of a. There we go. Okay. So now I can at least get a list of all the used uh, experts in this, which because there's strings, I mean, you could see how we may have been able to parse that string before, but in reality, these would have been complicated sort of uh, uh, macro type um, entities. Um, okay, clearly that was, uh, I bit off slightly too much. <laughs> um, no, that I was great. <laughs> but but <laughs> this is a pretty complicated example. Just one, one, two more minutes of just sort of summarizing the idea here, which is <laughs> we could have tried basically to take this graph data structure and and we need to do this very sort of complicated recursive operation for building up our our final expert right we want to build this final sort of completely flattened uh string representation of our composed layer graph but then we also want to do other things basically based that basically took the same shape in between but that shape was hidden the structure that we were building was kind of hidden in here because we were collapsing values so by identifying that pattern of operation and turning it into maybe a, a type class, just in an intermediate way, or just being observant about it, you can instead realize some other sort of structure that basically is an, an AST of a type class, essentially. Uh, and you can use that and return that instead. And then you can fold over that data structure in different ways to query it in different ways, because you've essentially preserved the structure of, 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 of composition and that's what was interesting about this layer. Uh, we can trivially gain the final expert like this, but we can also query it for other information, like how many nodes were used. Well, clearly now we can just, just count the used, uh, used length and things like this. But something as trivial as that would have been impossible to, very difficult to write another method for previously. Um, and this probably warrants another session. Uh, the name of this technique is, is basically, this is a free structure. That was the title of the talk. So I think, I think maybe we need to follow up where we sort of just go a little slower on just the free structure stuff, but it's kind of the final piece of this puzzle of just the, the duality of, of data and functionality, um, data and functions. Uh, it's, it's, it's basically taking a trait and turning it into an abstract syntax tree of the trait. And you can do that with any kind of trait. Um, and I think it's worth coming back so we could look at, at some of those things. Um, I hope that was interesting, but this technique is actually pretty, pretty useful um, when solving problems, especially, I think I deleted, maybe it's up here, this, the idea of, of having, yeah, I deleted it, but these, those really long arrows, <laughs> when you have uh, some really complicated uh, structure where you want to uh, project different pieces of information, it's always useful to find some point along the way, another data structure that you can derive from A that makes it trivial to derive subsequent computations from. That tends to make things a lot cleaner. It's just a form of refactoring, but that, that type ends up being a lot of the time one of these free structures. It's, it's a good tool to have in your belt, something to, to think of. Any final questions? <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry about the, the hecticness of the, the latter half of this. Yeah, you're great. Right. I think that was good. Uh, I'm not seeing any questions, so I think you well, maybe someone's typing, but you may have blown people away with knowledge. Oof, okay. <laughs> we, we, we need like a separate Reddit channel, like slain with knowledge. <laughs> All right, well, we'll come back to some of these ideas. So we can try to find something or we can do more, more sessions on this, but this was cool. Yeah, I, I feel like maybe we need to do another where we just do like a little more of the free structures because we like built up a lot of stuff. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I realized going through there, I was like, oh no, this graph example. It's a real world example I experienced, but also uh, yeah. it took a little while to connect the dots there. So yeah, I think that we could just do free structures for real on just sort of the theoretical side of it and just some examples um, and look at the use cases, simpler use cases as well. But yeah, thanks everybody. I uh, hope that was interesting. Um, uh, that was a lot of stuff. It was a long hour. Um, cool. Let me know if you have any like... This stuff is very cool and fascinating. Um, I still don't, I, I know it connects in some ways and I've tried to explain every way that I, I, I've been able to realize that it all connects, but I'm sure there's literature and things that I've miss, I'm missing. But I've seen tons of talks about these ideas and 
no one really stated these things clearly to me. It took a long time to get some, like the idea of like, oh, a, a church encoding is just the interpretation. It's just the fold. It's, it's representing a data type as its own interpretation. Maybe I didn't watch the right talks, but no one's ever said that to me. That made it click for me. Um, if anyone has ways of seeing these ideas uh, really intuitively, please share them because it's, it's hard stuff. I feel like an idiot half the time talking about it. Um, and I, I think there's, there's probably some really deep insights here. It feels that way. This feels like a holy little collection of ideas that are interrelated. Um, so please, if anyone has any other resources, um, please share them. I, I, wanna, I wanna further explore this stuff and, and hopefully be able to more eloquently express this in the future. But thank you again. If you have any other questions, please open issues on our uh, symposium repository. Otherwise, we will see you soon. Thank you, everyone. <laughs>